Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, on the subject of crucifixion, the Muslim is told in no uncertain terms in the Holy Quran, the last and final revelation of God. He is told, Wama kataluhu, wama falabuhu, that they didn't kill him, nor did they crucify him. Walakin shubbiha lahu, but it was made to appear to them so. Wa inna lazina khtalafu fihi lafi shakkin minhum, and those who dispute therein are full of doubts. Ma lahum bihim in ilm, they have no certain knowledge, illa tiba zhan, they only follow conjecture. Guess what? وَمَا قَتَلُهُ يَقِينًا For of a surety, they killed him not. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, could anyone have been more explicit, more dogmatic, more uncompromising in stating a belief than this, I ask you? Impossible. The only one who was entitled to say such words is none other than the all-knowing, omniscient Lord of the Universe. The Muslim believes this authoritative statement as the veritable Word of God. And as such, he asks no questions and he demands no proof. He says, these are the words of my Lord, Amanna Saddakna. I believe and I affirm. But the Christian responds in the words of our honorable guest in his book, Josh McDowell and Don Stewart, in answers to tough questions on page 116 and 17, he states the Christian attitude towards this uncompromising statement of the Muslim. He says, a major problem with accepting Muhammad's account is that his testimony is 600 years after the event occurred. While the New Testament contains eyewitness of first-hand testimony of the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. In a nutshell, the Christian says that how can a man a thousand miles away from the scene of the happening of the crucifixion and 600 years in time away from the happening, how could he know what happened in Jerusalem? The Muslim responds that these are the words of God Almighty and therefore, as such, God knew what had happened. The Christian naturally reasons that, look, had we accepted this book, the Quran, as the word of God, there would have been no dispute between us. We would all have been Muslims. We have eyewitness and your witness accounts of these happenings, which are stated for us in the Holy Bible, most especially in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now the implication of this crucifixion is this, that it is alleged that Jesus Christ was murdered by the Jews by means of crucifixion 2,000 years ago. And as such, the Jews are guilty of the murder of Jesus Christ. We Muslims are told that they are innocent because Christ was not killed nor was he crucified. And as such, I am given the brief by the Holy Quran to defend the Jews against the Christian charge. I am going to defend the Jews against this charge this afternoon, not because they are my cousins, but simply because justice must be done. We have our points of differences with the Jews, that is a different question altogether. This afternoon, I will try my very best to do justice to my cousins, the Jews. Now, in this argument, in this debate, this dialogue, I am actually the defense counsel for the Jews. 
and Josh McDowell is the prosecuting counsel. And you, ladies and gentlemen, are the ladies and gentlemen of the jury. And I want you to sit back relaxed and at the end of it, give judgment to yourself, to your own conscience, whether the Jews are guilty or not of the charge as alleged by the Christians. Now to get to the point, as a defense counsel for the Jews, I could have had this case against the Jews dismissed in just two minutes in any court of law in any civilized country in the world. Simply by demanding from the prosecuting counsel the testimonies of these witnesses, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and it, when they are presented in the form of affidavits, sworn affidavits as we have them in the Gospels, I could say that these sworn affidavits, in their original, they are not attested. And the proof, you get any authorized King James Version of the Bible, and you will find it beginning. Each and every affidavit begins. The Gospel according to St. Matthew. The Gospel according to St. Mark. The Gospel according to St. Luke. The Gospel according to St. John. I am asking, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, what is this according, according, according? Do you know what it means? It means Matthew, Mark, Luke and John didn't sign their names. It is only assumed that these are their works. And as such, in any court of law, in any civilized country, they will be thrown out of court in just two minutes. Not only that, I can have this case dismissed twice in two minutes. In any court of law, in any civilized country. I said twice, because Mark, one of the testators, in the Gospel of St. Mark, chapter 14, verse 50, he tells us that at the most critical juncture in the life of Jesus, all his disciples forsook him and fled. Oh. Says, to almal hum farlat and haflah. If they were not there, the testimony of those who were not there to witness what happened will be thrown out of court. I said twice in two minutes, in just 120 seconds flat, the case would be over. In any court of law, in any civilized country in the world. But what is the fun of it? You have come along from far and wide after all the threatening rain, and now they say the case is closed and go home. What is the fun of it? To entertain you, I am going to put these witnesses. I will accept those documents as valid for the sake of this dialogue. And we are now going to put these witnesses into the box for cross-examination. And I want you to see where truth lies. The first witness that I'm going to call happens to be Saint Luke. And St. Luke has been de described by Christian authorities as one of the greatest of historians. As a historical book, the Gospel of St. Luke is unique. Now, we get St. Luke, chapter 24, verse 36, and we ask. I'm going to tell you what he has said, what he has written in black and white. He tells us that it was Sunday evening, the first day of the week, that Jesus Christ, he walked into that upper room, the one in which he had the last supper with his disciples. This is three days after his alleged crucifixion. He goes in and he wishes his disciples, peace be unto you. Shalom Aleikum in Hebrew, Salam Aleikum in Arabic, Ugutula Gubenina in Zulu, Frida Fayala in Afrikaans, peace be unto you. And when he said peace be unto you, his disciples were terrified. Is that true? We are asking Luke. And he said yes. I 
would like to ask him, why were the disciples terrified? Because when one meets his long lost master, his grandfather, his guru, his rabbi, we Eastern people, we embrace one another, we kiss one another. Why should his disciples be terrified? So Luke tells us, he says they were affrighted because they thought he was a spirit. I'm only copying what he said, and you can verify in your own Bibles at home. They were affrighted, they were terrified because they thought he was a spirit. I'm asking Luke, did he, did he look like a spirit? And he says no. I'm asking all the Christians of the world, again and again, of every church and denomination, this master of yours, did he look like a spirit? And they all say no. Then I said, How, why should they think the man is a spirit when he didn't look like one? And everyone is puzzled. Unless Josh can explain. Every Christian is puzzled. Why should they think the man is a spirit when he didn't look like one? I will tell you. The reason is, because the disciples of Jesus, they had heard from hearsay that the master was hanged on the cross. They had heard from hearsay that he had given up the ghost. In other words, the spirit had come out. He had died. They had heard from hearsay that he's dead and buried for three days. All that knowledge was from hearsay because, as I said at the beginning, Mark chapter 14, your other witness, Verse 50, he says that at the most critical juncture in the life of Jesus, all his disciples forsook him and fled. All. That they were not there. So, all their knowledge being from hearsay, you come across such a person whom you, about whom you have heard that he has dead and buried for three days, you assume that he is thinking in his grave. Such a person when you see, naturally you are terrified. So Jesus wants to assure them that it's not what they are thinking. They are thinking that he's come back from the dead, a resurrected spiritualized body. So he says, I'm only quoting what Luke said. He says, behold my hands and my feet. Have a look at my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. It says, take now my hand and my footer, want it is excelled. I'm the same fellow man, what's wrong with you? Why are you afraid? Say, handle me and see. Handle me and see. For a spirit has no flesh and bones as you see me have. A spirit, indefinite article, a, a spirit means any spirit, has no flesh and bones as you see me have. So, if I have flesh and bones, in that case, I'm not a spirit, I'm not a ghost, I'm not a spook. I'm asking the English man, the one who speaks English as his mother tongue. If I have flesh and bones, in that case, I'm not a spirit, I'm not a ghost, I'm not a spook. I said, is that what it means it's in your language? One well, uh, yes. Yes, I think flesh and Vienna, she was jealous seeing that they kept me. I said, you are Africana. When a man tells you that, does it mean that he is not what you are thinking? That he's not a spirit, he's not a ghost, he's not a spook. And everybody responds, yes. If a man tells you a spirit has no flesh and bones, it means it has no flesh and bones. As you see me have, I have these things, so I'm not what you are thinking. You are thinking that I was dead and I have come back from the dead, resurrected. The spirit has no flesh and bone. In other words, he's telling you that the body that you are seeing, it is not a metamorphosed body, it is not a translated body, it is not a resurrected body. Because the resurrected body is spiritualized. You would like to know who says so as a Jesus. Who says so? My authority is Jesus. You say, where? I said, look, you look again. Chapter 20, verse 36. What does he say? I said, you see, the Jews were always coming to him with poses, with riddles. 
They were always asking him, Master, shall we pay tribute to Caesar or not? Master, this woman, we found her in the act. What shall we do to her? Master, again and again. Now they come to him and they ask him, he says, Master, Rabbi in the Hebrew language, Master, we had a woman among us. And this woman, according to a Jewish custom, had seven husbands. You see, according to a Jewish custom, if a brother, a man dies, and leaves no offspring, then the second fellow takes a wife. And when he fails, the third, and the fourth, and the fifth, and the sixth, and the seventh, seven guys had this woman as a wife. But there was no problem while on this earth, because it was all one by one. Now they want to know from him that at the resurrection, in the hereafter, which guy is going to have her, because they all had her here. In other words, there will be a war in heaven, because we believe that we will all be resurrected simultaneously, all together, one time. And if these seven brothers wake up at the same time, and they see this woman, and everyone will say, Mephro, it's my wife, Umka, me, it's my wife, and there will be a war in heaven between the brothers, for this one, one woman. So they want to know from him which guy is going to have her on the other side. Luke chapter 20 verse 36. Check it out. In answer to that Jesus says about these resurrected women, men and the women, he says, neither shall they die anymore. In other words, once they are resurrected, they will be immortalized. This is a mortal body. It needs food, shelter, clothing, sex, rest. Without these things, mankind perishes. That body will be an immortalized body. An immortal body. No food, no shelter, no clothing, no sex, no rest. He says, neither shall they die anymore. For they are equal unto the angels. In other words, they will be angelized. They will be spiritualized. They will be spiritual creatures. They will be spirits, for they are equal unto the angels and the children of God. Such are the children of the resurrection, such spirits. He says, a spirit has no flesh and bones, as you see me have. In other words, I am not resurrected. And they believe not for joy and wonder. Look 24 again. And they believe not for joy and wonder. What happened, man? We thought the man was dead and buried. Perhaps thinking in his grave. And they believe not for joy, overjoy, and they wonder what happened. So he says, have you here any meat, something to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish and a honeycomb. And he took it and he ate in the very sight. To prove what? And he had big khanyam and poor hala uwa khanyam. I'm asking ladies and gentlemen of the jury, what was he trying to demonstrate? What? I'm the same fellow man, I'm not what you are thinking, I have not come back from the dead. This was Sunday evening after the alleged crucifixion. Let's go back what happened in the morning. John, your other witness, John chapter 20 verse 1, he tells us that it was Sunday morning, the first day of the week, when Mary Magdalene, she went to the tomb of Jesus. I'm asking John, why did she go there? Or let's put another of your witnesses, Mark chapter 16 verse 1. Mark, I says, Mark tell us, why did Mary go there? And Mark tells us, she went to anoint him. Now the Hebrew word for anoint is masaha, from which we get the word Messiah in Hebrew and Masih in Arabic. The root word for both Arabic and Hebrew is the same, masaha, which means to rub, to massage, to anoint. I'm asking, do Jews massage dead bodies after three days? And the answer is no. I said, you Christians, do you massage dead bodies after three days? Do you? The answer is no. We Muslims, we are the closest to the Jew in our ceremony, the Lord. Do Muslims massage dead bodies after three days? 
The answer is no. Then why would they want to go and massage a dead rotten body after three days? Because within three hours you know that rigor mortis sets in, the hardening of the cells, the rotting of the body, fermentation from within. In three days time the body is, body is rotting from inside. Such a rotting body when you massage it falls to pieces. Why would she want to go and massage a dead rotten body? Unless she was looking for a live person. You see, according to your witnesses, from my reading, she must have seen signs of life in that limp body when it was taken down from the cross. Because she was about the only woman, besides Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, who had given the final rise to the body of Jesus. All his other disciples had forsaken him and fled. They were not there. So if this woman had seen signs of life, she was not going to shout and say, Hey, he's alive, he's alive, to invite a sure death. Three days later, she goes in and she wants to anoint him. And when she reaches the sepulchre, she finds that the stone is removed and the winding sheets inside. So she starts to cry. I'm asking, why was the stone removed and why were the winding sheets unwound? Because for a resurrected body, you don't have to remove the stone to come out. For a resurrected body, you don't have to unwind the winding sheets to move. This is the need of this physical body, this mortal body. Because a poet tells us, the stone walls do not a prison make, nor iron bars a cage. For the soul, for the spirit, these things do not matter, iron bars or walls. That's the need of this physical body. Jesus Christ according to the scriptures, was watching her from wherever he was. Not from heaven, but from this earth. Because this tomb, if you remember, was a privately owned property belonging to Joseph of Arimathea, his very rich, influential disciple. She is supposing him to be the gardener. I said, why does she suppose he's the gardener? Because the resurrected bodies can't die twice. Who said so? I said the Bible. What does it say? It says, it is ordained unto all men once to die, and after that, who can't die twice. So if you are dead, there will be no need to be afraid. He's afraid because he didn't die. So she's supposing him to be the God. Huh? Says, sir, if you have taken him hence, Tell me, where have you laid him to rest, to relax, to recuperate, not where have you buried him? So that I might take him away. I, alone, one woman, a frail Jewess, imagine her carrying away a corpse of 160 pounds at least, at least, not 200 like me. A muscular carpenter, supposed to be, Young man in the prime of his life, at least 160 pounds. And another 100 pounds weight of medicants around him, according to John chapter 19, verse 39. That makes him 260. Can you imagine this frail Jewess carrying this bundle of a corpse over 260 pounds, like a bundle of straw, like a superwoman in the American comics? And take him where? Take, her, take it home, put it under a bed. What does she want to do with it? Want to pickle him? What does she want to do with a rotting body? I ask you. She wants to take him away, that I might take him away. This is your language. You must tell me, ladies and gentlemen, that in my language, when it is said a spirit has no flesh and bones, that it means a spirit has flesh and bones. This is how you have to correct me. You must tell me you don't understand English, Mr. Dida or American English, that in America when we say a spirit has no flesh and bones, it means a spirit has flesh and bones. When a woman says that I might take him away, it means she's got a, a troop with her. So Jesus, the joke had gone too far, so he says, Mary, the way he said Mary, she recognized that this was Jesus. So she wants to grab him. I'm asking why? 
to buy food? No, to pay his fees. We Eastern people do. She wants to grab him. So Jesus says, touch me not. I say, why not? Is there a bottle of electricity, a dynamo, that if she touches him, she'll get electrocuted? Tell me, why not? I say, because it hurts. You give me another reason. Why not? Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended unto my father. Is she blind? Can't she see the man is standing there beside her? What does it mean that I'm not born up when he's here? He said, I am not yet ascended unto my father. In the language of the Jew, in the idiom of the Jew, he's saying, I am not dead yet. The problem arises. Who moved the stone? How could she get it? Who moved the stone? And the Christians are writing books upon books. One Frank Morrison, a rationalist lawyer, he writes a book of 192 pages and he gives six hypotheses. And at the end of the 192 pages, when you finish, you still haven't got the answer. Who moved the stone? And they're writing books upon books. Who moved the stone? I said, you know, I can't see. I can't understand. Why can't you see the very obvious? Why don't you read your books? These gospels, these evidence, you have it in black and white in your own mother tongue. This is an anomaly that you read this book in your own mother tongue. The Englishman in English, the Afrikaner in Afrikaans, the Zulu in Zulu. Every language group has got the book in their own language. And each and every one is made to understand the exact opposite of what he's reading. Exact opposite. Not just merely misunderstanding. I want you to prove me wrong. I'm telling you, I'm only quoting word for word. Exactly as your witnesses have said it, preserved it for us in that way. I'm not attributing motives to that. I'm not saying that they're dishonest witnesses. I'm telling you, please read this book of yours once more again without the blinkers. Remove the blinkers and read it once more again. And tell me where I'm not understanding your language. You Englishman or you African or you Zulu, you come back to me. And if you feel at the end of the talk that our honored visitor has not done justice to the subject, you call me to your kingdom hall or to your school hall or anywhere you want to discuss further with me, I'm prepared to come. Who moved the stone? I am asking, it's very simple, they're talking about 20 men required. Because they are so huge, it needed a superman from America to move it. One and a half to two ton. I'm telling you, please read Mark and Matthew, and he tells you that Joseph of Arimathea alone he put the stone into place. One man. Alone! One man! If one man can put it in place, why, why can't two persons remove that asking? Now, all those happenings. You know, when it was prophesied, it was ordained, and all the stories about what ought to have happened and what happened. I am telling you that Jesus Christ had given me a clear cut indication of what was going to happen. And that's also preserved in black and white in your testimony, in the Gospel of St. Matthew, another of the witnesses, chapter 38. I'm a big about it. Chapter 12, verses 38, 39, and 40. The Jews come again to Jesus, again to Jesus, with a new request. Now they say, Master, we would have a sign of thee. We want you to show the miracle to convince us that you are the Messiah we are waiting for. You know, something supernatural, like walking on the water, flying the air like a bird. Do something, man. Then we will be convinced that you are a man of God, the Messiah we are waiting for. So Jesus answers them. He says, an evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, but there shall no sign be given unto it, except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights, in the belly of the way, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the belly of the earth. 
the only sign he was prepared to give them was the sign of Jonah. He has put all his eggs in one basket. He didn't say, you know, blind Bartimaeus, I healed it. You know that woman with issues? She was bleeding for years. She touched me and she was healed. You know I fed 5,000 people with a few pieces of fish and a few pieces of bread. You know another 3,000 on another occasion. You know that fig tree I dried it up with from its very roots. Nothing like that. This is the only sign I'm going to give you is the sign of Jonah. I'm asking, what was that sign? Well, go to the book of Jonah. I brought the book of Jonah for you. One page. My God is only one page in the whole Bible. This is the book of Jonah. Four short chapters. It won't take you two minutes to read it. Book of Jonah. This is the book of Jonah. One page. It's hard to find because in a thousand pages, to find one page is difficult. But you don't have to go there. If you went to Sunday school, you will remember what I'm telling you. I'm telling you that Jonah was sent to the Ninevites. You know, God Almighty told him, go to Nineveh, just to give 100,000 people, and warn them that they must repent in sackcloth and in ashes. Humble themselves before the Lord and come right. Jonah, instead of going to Nineveh, he is despondent that these materialistic people, worldly people, they will not listen to me. They might make a mockery of what I have to tell them. So instead of going to Nineveh, he goes to Joppa. That's what this one book, one big book does. He went to Joppa. And he's taken a boat and he's going to Tarshish. You don't have to remember the names. On the way is a storm. And according to the superstitions of these people, anyone who runs away from his master's command, who fails to do his, do, uh, do his duty, creates such a turmoil at sea. So they began to question in the boat, who could be responsible for this turmoil? Jonah realizes that as a prophet of God, he was a soldier of God. And as a soldier of God, he had no right to do things presumptuously on his own. So he says that, look, I'm the guilty party. God Almighty is after my blood. He wants to kill me. So in the process, you see the boat. And you innocent people will die. It will be better for you if you take me and you throw me overboard. Because God is really after my blood. They say, no man. You know, you are such a good man. Perhaps you want to commit suicide. We won't help you to do that. We have a system of our own of discovering right from wrong. And that is what they call by like casting of lots. Like head or tail. Head or tail. So according to the system of casting lots, no, no, throwing dice, it came to the turn of Jonah that Jonah was found to be the guilty man. And so they took him and they threw him overboard. Now I'm going to ask you a question. That when they threw him overboard, was he dead or was he alive? Now, before you answer, I want you to bear in mind that the man Jonah had volunteered. He said, throw me. And when a man volunteers, you don't have to strangle him before throwing. You don't have to spear him before throwing. You don't have to break his arm or limb before throwing. You agree with me? The man had volunteered. So when they threw him overboard, your common sense, what does he say? Was he dead or was he alive? Please, I want your help. Was he dead or was he alive? Alive. You get no price for that. It was too simple a question. And astonishing. The Jews said he was alive, the Christians said he was alive, and the Muslims said he was alive. How much nicer it would be if we would agree on every other thing like that. We are all agreed that he was alive when he was thrown into that raging sea and the storm subsided. Perhaps it was a coincidence. A fish comes and gobbles him, dead or alive. Was he dead or was he alive? Alive! Thank you very much. From the fish's belly, According to the book of Job, he cries to God for help. Do dead men pray, Mr. Buddha? Do they pray? Dead people, do they pray? No! Dead people pray. <laughs> so he was alive. Three days and three nights the fish chasing around the ocean, dead or alive? Alive. On the third day, vomits him on the seashore and asks him, dead or alive? Alive. What did Jesus say? He said, for as Jonah was, once was Jonah, 
green dye and green nectar in the bake from the fruit fish. What? So shall the sale from the man's green dye and green nectar in the heart from the RBS. Go back to your turn. Why is this sister? Say, come on, is in Sugu, is in Tato, no Sugu, O Tato, can tell you again. Then, brother, no moon, we are go back. So, what do you mean? Go Tata, is in Sugu, is in Tato, no Sugu, O Tato. Just like Jonah, for us. Jonah was social son of man B, referring to himself. How was Jonah? They were alive. Alive. How was Jesus for three days and three nights in the tomb, according to the Christian belief? How was he? Dead or alive? Dead. He was dead, according to your belief. In other words, he's unlike Jonah. Can't you see? He said, I will be like Jonah, and you are telling me, these 1,200 million Christians of the world, that he was unlike Jonah. He said, I will be like Jonah. You say he's unlike Jonah. If I was a Jew, I will not accept him as my Messiah. I am told in the Quran that Jesus was the Messiah. I accept. He was one of the mightiest messengers of God. I accept. I believe in his miraculous birth. I believe that he gave life to the dead by God's permission. And he healed those born blind and the lepers by God's permission. But if I was a Jew, according to the sign that he has given, he failed. Jonah is alive. Jesus is dead. They are unlikes. I know, don't know in what language you can make them like, that they're like one another. So the clever man, you know, the doctor of theology, the professor of uh, religion, he tells me that I don't understand the Bible. Your Bible, I don't understand. Why don't I understand the Bible? He says, you see, Mr. D. Dad, Jesus Christ is emphasizing the time factor. Look, he uses the word three, four times. For as Jonah was three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights. He uses the word three, four times. In other words, he's emphasizing the time factor, not whether he was dead or alive. I'm telling you that there is nothing miraculous in a time factor. Nothing miraculous about a time factor. Whether the man was dead for three minutes or three hours or three weeks, that's not a miracle. The miracle is, if at all, that you expect a man to be dead, and he's not dead. When Jonah was thrown, when Jonah was thrown into the sea, we expect him to die. He didn't die, so it's a miracle. A fish comes and gobbles him, he ought to die. He didn't die, it's a miracle. Three days and three nights, suffocation and heat in the whale's belly, he ought to die. He didn't die, it's a miracle. It's a miracle, because we expect the man to die and he didn't die. When you expect a man to die and if he dies, what's the miraculous about that? I'll ask you, what's miraculous about that? If a gunman took a gun and fired six shots into the hearts of Kennedy, and he died, is that a miracle? No. But if he laughed it off, if he's still alive and walking with us, this is, you know, after the six shots tearing his heart to pieces, he laughed. <laughs> He's alive. So he says a miracle. Can't you see? The miracle is when you expect the man to die and he doesn't die. The man when you expect him to die and he dies, there's no miracle. We expect Jesus also to die for what he had been through. If he died, there's no miracle. There's no sign. If he didn't die, it's a miracle. Can't you see? So he says, no, no, it's a time factor. Drowning men clutches at straw. Drowning women do the same. This is a time factor. I said, did he fulfill that? Oh, he said, of course, he fulfilled that. I said, how did he fulfill it? Look, it's very easy to make statements. How did he fulfill it? I says, watch. When was Jesus crucified, I ask you? The whole Christian world says Good Friday. In South Africa, we have a public holiday, Hui Freidach. Hui Freidach. Britain, France, Germany, America, Lesotho, Zambia, every Christian nation commemorates Good Friday. I am asking what makes Good Friday good? So the Christian says, Christ died for our sin. That makes it good. So he was crucified on a Good Friday. He said, yes, yes. I said, when was he crucified, morning or afternoon? So they say, in the afternoon. How long was he on the cross? Some say three hours, some say six hours. 
I said, I'm not going to argue with you. Whatever you say, I accept. You know, when we read the scriptures, they tell us that when they wanted to crucify Jesus, they were in a hurry. And they were in such a hurry that Josh tells us in his book, The Resur Resurrection Factor, that within some 12 hours, there were six separate trials in six, 12 hours. Six trials he went through. These things only happen in films. They, these sort of things, six trials in 12 hours from midnight till the next morning and carry on, six trials in 12 hours only take place on films. But I believe whatever you tell me. Whatever you tell me, I will accept. So, the Jews were in a hurry to put him up on the cross. You know why? Because of the general public. Jesus was a, the hero, the general public. They loved him. The man had healed the blind and the lepers and quickened the dead. He had fed so many thousands of people with bread and fish. He was the hero. And if they discovered, the general public, that the hero's life was in danger, they would have been a riot. So, they had a midnight trial. Early in the morning they take him to Pilate. Pilate says, not my kettle fish, take him to Herod. He says, Herod says, I'm not interested, take him back to Pilate. And hurry, hurry, hurry. And they did six trials in 12 hours. Six. As if they had nothing else to do. But I believe what you tell me. They succeeded in putting him up on the cross. According to your witnesses. According to your witnesses. But as much as they, were in a, as in, they were in a hurry to put him up, they were in a hurry to bring him down. You know why? Because of the Sabbath. Because at sunset on Friday, 6 o'clock, the Sabbath starts. You see the Jews, they count their days, night and day, night and day. We Muslims, we count our days, night and day, night and day, not day and night. We count night and day, 6 o'clock, our day begins at, in the evening. So before sunset, the body must come down because they were told in the book of Deuteronomy that they must see to it that nobody is hanging on the tree on the Sabbath day that thy land be not defiled with the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance. So quickly, quickly, they brought the body down and they gave him a burial bath and they put 100 pounds weight of medicants around him and they put him into the sepulcher, not a grave, sepulcher, a big roomy chamber above ground. So it's already yielding. It's already evening, from 3 o'clock in the afternoon, whatever you do, and the burial bath, the details are given in Josh's book. You know that burial bath alone will take more than an hour. You read the details, how the Jews give the burial bath to the, to the dead. That takes more than an hour itself. But let's say they succeeded in doing all these things in a hurry, hurry. You know they were in a hurry, six trials in 12 hours. Now they put him into the sepulchre. By the time they put him in, it's already evening. So watch. Watch my fingers. Friday night, he's supposed to be in the grave. Watch my finger. Saturday day, he's still supposed to be in the grave. Am I right? Saturday night, he's still supposed to be in the grave. But Sunday morning, first day of the week, when Mary Magdalene goes to the tomb, the tomb was empty. That's what your witnesses say. I'm asking how many days and how many nights. You remember? I said, supposed, supposed, supposed. You know why? Because the Bible doesn't say actually when he came out, he could have come out Friday night. But because the Bible doesn't say, I won't say it. So, Friday night, Saturday day, Saturday night. I'm asking how many days and how many nights. Please, if you can see, if your eyes are not defective, tell me how many. How many do you see? How many? Huh? Right, two nights and a day. Look at this. Is it the same as this? He said, for as Jonah was three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights. Three and three, three and three. Look at this. Look at this, two and one. Look at this. Please tell me now, it means the same thing. I want to know what you are reading. I want to know what you are reading in your own book. The man is telling you what is going to happen will be like Jonah. And the sign of Jonah is a miracle. And the only miracle you can attribute to this man Jonah is that we expect him to die and he didn't die. Jesus, we expect him also to die. If he died, it is not a sign. If he didn't die, it's a sign. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, the verdict is there. Can you see? The people have been programmed. We all get programmed from childhood.
When I went to America, Berkeley University in San Francisco, I was you know, alleging against these American students and professors, I said, you people are brainwashed. I told them, you are brainwashed. Of course, I could afford to talk to them. The American can take it. He is the almighty, you know, great guy. He can take it. I said, you people are brainwashed. So one American, you know, professor, he interjected, he said, no, not brainwashed, programmed. I said, I beg your pardon, programmed. So, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, I hope by the time this meeting is over, you will be reprogrammed into reading the book as it is and not as you are made to understand. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Kuya Midak, Dama Senyera. Sabon, Salam, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Mr. Dedat and the wonderful people of this city and country of South Africa, I am thankful for the opportunity to be a part of this symposium on Islam and Christianity's view of the crucifixion and the resurrection. In preparation for this, I didn't realize in coming to it that I would probably have to deal with so many diverse different theories on the crucifixion from the Islamic viewpoint. I found out first of all that the majority of the Muslims throughout the world hold to the substitutionary theory. That in Surah number four, they believe there is the Quran presents, they th say, that another person was placed in Christ's position on the cross, that Jesus was removed and taken to heaven. In other words, it was someone else. But then when I found I got to that someone else, I found such a diverse opinion. Some say, the Muslim writers say, that it was a disciple of Jesus that was placed on the cross in his stead. Another Muslim writer, Tabari, quotes Ibn Ishaq, said it was a man by the name of Sargus, or Sergius, who was placed in the cross. Another Muslim writer by the name of Baidavi said it was a Jew named Titanus that was placed in the cross. Another, Athalabi, says it was a Jew named Paltayanus that was placed in the cross. And still another Muslim writer, Wab Ibn Manaba said it was a rabbi of the Jews, a shayu, that was placed on the cross. Then others feeling that it might be a little unfair to put an innocent man there said, well, it must be Judas Iscariot that was placed on the cross. Now, if Mr. Didat might be able to correct me, but I do not believe there's any evidence whatsoever in the Quran for that. There is in some of these sects earlier than Islam that have references to that. But I always wondered why did God have to have a substitute? Why couldn't he have simply taken Jesus then? Others will say, and this is not the majority Muslim belief, that Jesus died a natural death some years after the crucifixion and the alleged resurrection. In other words, Hazrat Isa, Jesus, is dead. This is a more recent development, and I'm always leery of more recent developments. It started mainly by a man by the name of Venturini that said Jesus really didn't die on the cross. He just swooned or passed out, was put into a tomb, and resuscitated. Now, this is also the theme of the Ahmadiyyas, a radical sect of Islam, it's their main doctrine, or one of their main doctrines, by their founder and allegedly their prophet, Mirza Ghulam Ahmad. I, therefore, Jesus wasn't crucified because he did not die on the cross. I'm not quite sure how they ever got that definition. What I need to do is this. Present the facts to you. As I've been able to document them in my works, 
and then let you, as a fair-minded, intelligent people, make up your mind. The background for the points I'm going to make is that when I was in the university, I wanted to write a book against Christianity. I wanted to refute it intellectually. The last thing I wanted to do was become a Christian. But after two years of research and spending a lot of money and time, I discovered certain facts. Not only facts that God has stated in His Holy Word, the Bible, but facts that are documented in sources in history. Men and women, these are some of the facts that I found as I tried to refute Christianity, and I couldn't. The first fact is that I found out that Jesus was not afraid to die. He was not reluctant to die. In fact, he predicted his own death and resurrection. He said, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, he said to his disciples, and the Son of Man will be delivered up to the death. And they will deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and to whip and to crucify him. And on the third day, he will be raised up. Another place, he began to teach them that he had to suffer many things. And then he says, he'll be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes, will be killed. And he says, after three days, I am to rise again. In Matthew 17, Jesus said to them, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him, and he will be raised up again on the third day. The second thing I learned as I studied the life of Jesus Christ is that Jesus was willing to die. He was willing to die. In Matthew 26, he said, My Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. But what a lot of people leave out is the context of what Jesus said it. He said, Yet not as I will, but as thou wilt, Father. Now, Jesus did not hide himself. He is very clear where it says in John 18 that he went to the place where they usually found him. He didn't want to hide from the authorities. He knew what was going to happen. In John 18, verse 4, it says, Jesus, therefore, knowing all the things that were going to come up on him, he knew it, and he was ready for it. In Matthew, Jesus says, Don't you understand? I could call on 12 legions of angels to protect me. But he said, I want your will, Father, and God answered his prayers and let him fulfill the will of the Father. Jesus said in John 10, he said, The Father loves me because I lay down my life. I lay my life down and I may take it up again. No one has taken it away from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. You have to remember, Jesus being the God-man, came as the Father's Son, the eternal Word, to take the sins of the world upon himself. For the Holy Bible says that he, God, made Jesus sin for us. And if you can imagine the agony that the eternal Word, the Son, was going through at that time. The third point that I learned, the third fact, is I learned the third fact is the Jews are not guilty of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. I was very surprised, Mr. D. Dot, that you needed to be the defender of the Jews. There are Muslims and Christians that get that distorted all through history. Jesus said in Matthew 20, verses 18 and 19, He said, We are going up to Jerusalem, and they will condemn me to death, 
and will deliver me over to the Gentiles to mock and whip and crucify him. Jesus said, I lay down my life. If anyone was guilty, Jesus was. He said, I have the power to lay it down. I have the power to take it up. Also, Mr. D. Dot, I feel that you and I both are responsible because the Bible says, please, the Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It was our sins that drove Jesus Christ to the cross. The fourth fact that I learned is that the Christians are called to an intelligent, intellectual faith, not a blind faith. I was quite surprised when I read in the little booklet, What Was the Sign of Jonah by Mr. Ahmad Didat. He said over 1,000 million Christians today blindly accept that Jesus of Nazareth is the Christ. I'm a little confused because earlier, Mr. Daydot, you read from the Quran and said you accept it, you don't need facts, you don't need any evidence, you simply accept it. And then you're saying to the Christians because they accept what God, Yahweh, has revealed in the Holy Bible, that Jesus is the Christ, that we accept that, we do it blindly. I'm amazed because in the Muslim book, the Quran, states that one of the titles given to Jesus is Al-Messiah. I believe it is referred to 11 times that way. The Muslim translator of the Quran into the English, Yusuf Ali, translate the Arabic here as Christ in the English. So why are we accused of being blind in accepting Jesus as the Christ? In my country, one of the greatest legal minds that ever lived, the man that made in my country the varsity or University of Harvard famous was Dr. Simon Greenleaf, the great legal mind. He became a Christian through trying to refute Jesus Christ as the eternal word and the resurrection. Finally, after trying to do it, he came to the conclusion that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is one of the best established events of history according to the laws of legal evidence administered in the courts of justice. C.S. Lewis, the literary genius of our age, men and women, the professor of medieval and renaissance literature at Oxford, a giant that no one could question his intellectual capabilities, became a believer in Jesus Christ as a Savior and Lord when he tried to refute the reliability of the New Testament, and he couldn't. And he said, I was one of the most reluctant converts, but I was brought to Jesus Christ because of my mind. Lord Caldegoat, the Lord Chief Justice of England, a man that held the highest offices that anyone could hold in the legal systems of England, said, as often as I have tried to examine the evidence for Christianity, I have come to believe it as a fact beyond dispute. Thomas Arnold, for 14 years the headmaster of a major varsity, a university. He is the author of the famous three-volume series on the history of Rome, an historian. He said, quote, I know of no one fact in the history of mankind which is by better and fuller evidence proven than the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Dr. Werner von Braun, the German scientist, the man that immigrated to my country and he created the American space program, said he never really became a scientist until he came to know Jesus Christ personally as Savior and God. The fifth fact that I discovered was the historical accuracy of the Christian Bible. The Christian New Testament is exceptional in its reliability and trustworthiness and survival down through history. In manuscript authority, a manuscript is a handwritten copy over against a printed copy. Men and women of the Christian New Testament alone in history, there are more than 24 thousand manuscripts, not versions, Mr. D. Dot, 
manuscripts, copies. Men and women, the number two book in all of history in manuscript authority and literature is Homer's Iliad with 643. The number two book in all of history in manuscript authority. Then Sir Frederick Kenyon, a man who is second to no one in the ability and the training to make authoritative statements about manuscripts of literature in history. The former curator of the British Museum said, the last foundation for any doubt that the scriptures have come down to us as they were written now have been removed. Both the authenticity and the general integrity of the books of the New Testament may now be regarded as finally established. The point, then there's some people who do not have an historical perspective of literature that will try to make an issue out of the fact that the writers of the four accounts of the gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, never signed their names. Please, men and women, we need to go back to history and see how they did it then. First of all, they were so well accepted. Way back at that time, they were so well accepted as being authoritative, and everyone knowing who wrote them, they did not need their names placed on them. And you might say it was their way of not distracting from making Jesus Christ the sec central issue. Also, these authors, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, went through the apostolic period. They went through the test of the apostolic period of the first century to confirm their accuracy, authenticity, and reliability. Others, through limited reading and absence of any type of research, say that the documents of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are hearsay because the writers were not eyewitnesses of the events surrounding the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus Christ. These, the people that say that will often appeal to Mark 1450 when they said within two minutes I could dismiss the argument because they all left him and fled. So therefore everything was hearsay. Men and women, this line of reasoning ignores common sense in the facts of the case. For example, now I had this all written out before I even came to this symposium. For example, one, read just the next four verses, and it says this, and Peter followed him. You see, they left him in a group, but they came back individually immediately, Mr. D. Dot. In verse four, in verse 4, and Peter followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest. And he was sitting there with the officers, I mean, can you imagine, with the officers and warming himself. In Mark 14, it says, and Peter was below in the courtyard. Men and women, if you have studied the scriptures, you'll realize that Mark in his gospel was writing down all the eyewitness accounts of Peter. Peter was right there. Then we go to John 18, verse 15. And Simon Peter was following Jesus, and so was another disciple. Now the disciple was known to the high priest and entered in with Jesus into the very court of the high priest. John 19. And when Jesus therefore saw his mother and his disciple, whom he loved, standing right near by the cross, he said after three days, or excuse me, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. They were eyewitnesses, they were there. About being permissible in a court of law. In most legal situations, you have what can be referred to as an ancient document rule. Now you have to go to law to substantiate these things. Dr. John Warwick Montgomery, a lawyer and a dean of the Simon Greenleaf School of Law, a lecturer at the International School of Theology and Law in Strasbourg, France, 
said that the application of the ancient document rule to the documents in the New Testament, especially the four Gospels, he says, this is ahead of a law school speaking, applied to the Gospel records and reinforced by responsible lower textual criticism, this rule would establish competency in any court of law. Some of the eyewitness testimony, the greatest eyewitness testimony, is not found in the Gospels. It is found in 1 Corinthians, the epistles by the Apostle Paul, chapter 15. Written in 55 to 56 AD, I have yet to find a reputable scholar that will deny that. Paul says, now he'd already 20 years earlier, right after his conversion, he had met with the leaders. He had met with James, the brother of Jesus, in Jerusalem. He said, the tradition passed on to me is there were over 500 eyewitnesses of the resurrection. Now, if you take that in a court of law, give each eyewitness just six minutes, that would make 3,000 eyewitnesses or, or minutes of eyewitness testimony or 50 hours of eyewitness testimony. However, that's not the key point here. That was the tradition handed down to him that he had examined. But Paul says then, the majority of them are still alive right now. Not when the tradition was passed down, but right now. Paul was saying this, men and women, if you don't believe me, ask them. Also, many people overlook the fact that when the message of Jesus Christ was presented by the apostles and the disciples and the New Testament was shared, in the audience were the presence of hostile antagonistic witnesses. If they would have dared to have depart from the truth of what was said, there was in the audience the presence of hostile witnesses to immediately correct them. In a court of law, that is the principle of cross-examination. They did not dare to depart from the truth. Also, apart from the body, the Bible, you have several extra-biblical secular sources here. One, a man by the name of Polycarp that was a disciple of the Apostle John. He writes in his works, going back almost 2,000 years ago, so firm is the ground upon which these Gospels rest that even the heretics themselves could not undermine it. They had to start from what was presented and then develop their own heresy because even then they could not say, Jesus didn't say that, Jesus didn't do that, that they couldn't do that. So they had to start with what he said and develop their own heresy. The conclusion of many scholars is a tremendous confidence in the Christian Bible. Dr. Millar Burroughs, on the staff, who was on the staff of Yale University in my country, one of our most prestigious universities said, there is an increase of confidence in the accurate transmission of the text of the New Testament itself. Dr. Howard Boss, a researcher and archaeologist, said, from the standpoint of literary evidence, the only logical conclusion is that the case for the reliability of the New Testament is infinitely stronger than any other record of antiquity. The sixth fact that I discovered, that Christ was crucified. What does the historical, reliable record show? It is clear not only from the Christian biblical historical record, but also from secular sources, which I documented in the back of my book, Evidence That Demands a Verdict, that he was not only predicting his death by crucifixion, but that he was actually crucified. Jesus said that he would be whipped and delivered over to be crucified. And then in John 19, they took Jesus therefore and he went out bearing his own cross to the place of the skull. 
There they crucified him with two other men, one on either side and Jesus in between. Now let's follow through what happened at crucifixion. First of all, it points out that Jesus was whipped by the Romans. What did that mean? The Romans would strip a person down to the waist, would tie him in the courtyard. Then they would take a whip, a, had a handle about a foot and a half long. At the end of the handle, it had at least four leather throngs that went out with heavy, jagged bone or balls of lead with jagged edges wound into the end of the straps, a minimum of five. Then they would, they would be at different lengths. They would bring the whip down over the back of the individual and all the balls of lead or bone would hit the body at the same time and then they would yank it down. The Jews would only permit 40 lashes. So they never did more than 39 so they wouldn't break the law. The Romans could do as many as they wanted. So custom pointed out when the Romans whipped a Jew, they did 41 or more out of spite to the Jews. And so he had probably at least 41, if not more, lashes. There are several medical authorities that have done research on crucifixion. One is a Dr. Barbet in France, and another is a Dr. C. Truman Davis in the state of Arizona in my country. He is a medical doctor who has done meticulous study of the crucifixion from a medical perspective. Here he gives the effect of the Roman flagrum. The heavy whip is brought down with full force again and again across a person's shoulders, back, and legs. At first, the heavy throngs cut through the skin only. Then as the blows continue, they cut deeper into the subcutaneous tissue, producing first an oozing of blood from the capillaries and veins of the skin, and finally spurting arterial bleeding from vessels and underlying vessels. vessels. The small balls of lead first produce large, deep bruises, which the other blows cut wide open. Finally, the skin on the back is hanging in long ribbons, and an entire area is an unrecognizable mass of torn, bleeding tissue. Other sources I have documented said sometimes the back is literally opened up, men and women, to the bowels from within. Many people die just from the whipping. Then they took out and drove spikes into his wrists and his feet. Now, it says, late that afternoon on Friday, that they broke the legs of the two thieves hanging with Jesus, but they did not break his legs. Now, why did they break someone's legs? When you were prostrate on the cross, or hanging there, they bent the legs up underneath and drove the spike through. When you died of crucifixion, often what happened, you died from your own air. The pectoral muscles would be affected and you could not let your air out. You could take it in but not let it out. And so you'd hang there and suffocate. So you push up with your legs, let the air out, and then come down and take it in. When they wanted to bring them out to death immediately, they broke their legs and they couldn't push up and they would die. <laughs> now, Jesus' legs were not broken. As the Bible, the Holy God revealed in His Holy Word, the Bible, that Jesus had died. Now, if they had broken His legs, men and women, He would not have been our Messiah. He would not have been the Eternal Word because God, Yahweh, in the Old Testament prophesied in Psalms that His legs would not be broken. His bones would not be broken. Men and women, he was fulfilling what God, Yahweh, had already revealed would take place. The ninth fact that I discovered was that Christ... What time is mine over with? How much more? Well, how much more time? 20 minutes? Christ was dead. That's the ninth fact that I discovered. Men and women, in John 19.30, Jesus willed himself to die. That's why it didn't take so long. 
He came to die. He said, I lay my life down. And in John 19, he says, it is finished. And he bowed his head and he gave up the spirit. He willed himself to die. Now in John 19, verse 34, that Mr. Didot in his booklet has referred to as evidence that Jesus was not dead, the blood and water. He was on the cross. They'd already acknowledged him being dead, but they thought they'd give a parting shot, as you would say. They took a spear and thrust it into his side. Eyewitness accounts said blood and water came out separated. Mr. Didat, in his book, appeals to this phenomenon as evidence that Christ was still alive. He supports this in his writings by an appeal to an article in the Thinker's Digest, 1949, by an enthesiologist. I was able to acquire medical research by various people into this area. I just shared two of the findings, one from a scholastic viewpoint. Many medical and university or varsity libraries now that once carried this journal no longer does so. It is considered by many in the medical field to be not only out of date, but behind the medical times. Second, from the medical viewpoint, a wound of the type inflicted on Jesus if he was still alive, would not bleed out the wound opening, but bleed into the chest cavity, causing an internal hemorrhage. At the aperture of the wound, the blood would be barely oozing from the opening. The odds of a spear forming a perfect channel that would allow the blood and serum to flow out the spear wound is next to impossible. The massive internal damage done to a person under crucifixion and then being speared in the heart area would cause death almost immediately, not even including what happens with the Jewish burial. At the Massachusetts, in my country, the state of Massachusetts, General Ithmo Hospital, over a period of years did research of people that died of a ruptured heart. Normally the heart has 20 cc's of periocardial fluid. When a person dies of a ruptured heart, there is over 500 cc's of periocardial fluid after death has taken place. And it comes out in the form of a fluid and clotted blood. Perhaps this is what was viewed at that time. The Jewish burial would have put any final death blow. As Mr. Didot says in his book, page 9, What Was the Sign of Jonah? says they gave the Jewish burial bath, plastered it with 100 pounds of aloes and myrrh. Now can you see, going through the whipping where your back is almost laid open bare, having your arms and feet pierced, put in the cross, a spear thrust in your side, taken down, then plastered with a hundred and some pounds of spices and cement consistency, he had caused, called for a greater miracle if he even lived through that. Then, the severe discipline of the Romans. Pilate was a little amazed, and I would have been too, that Christ had already been dead or that they had come and asked for the body. So he called the centurion in, and he says, I want you to go and confirm to me that Jesus was dead. Now, men and women, this centurion was not a fool. He was not about ready to leave his wife a widow. The centurion would go out and they would always check with four different executioners. That was Roman law. There had to be four executioners. They did that so in case one man was a little lax, the other one would catch him in it. And you would never have all four lax in signing the death warrant. Now discipline was severe with the Romans. For example, when the angel let Peter out of jail in Acts 12 in the New Testament, Herod called in the guard and executed them all just for letting one man out of jail. Paul and Silas in Acts 16 in the Christian New Testament 
The doors had been opened up to the jail. Their chains had been loose. And the moment the guard saw they were gone, he pulled out his own sword to execute himself. And Paul says, wait a minute. You see, that guard knew he would rather die by his own sword than be executed by the Romans. Then Christ was dead. Flavius Josephus, the Jewish historian, records when he went into Jerusalem, when Titus in 70 AD was destroying it, he saw three of his friends being crucified. They'd just been put up there. They had been whipped and everything. He went to the commander of the guard and he says, please release them. Now you have to understand, Flavius was the name given to Josephus by the Roman emperor. He brought him into his own family. That's why he had influence as a Jew. And you know, immediately the Roman guard, captain, took the three men down from the cross and still men and women, two of the three died. And they'd just been put up there and they were removed. Crucifixion was that cruel. Now the Jews knew that he was dead. In Matthew 27, they went to the Roman leader and said, Sir, we remember that when he was still alive. In other words, what is he? Dead. When he was still alive, he said, after three days, I am to rise again. Now, some, and I, I believe Mr. Didot has in his books, saying that the Jews realized they'd made a mistake. He really wasn't dead. So they thought they wouldn't make a second mistake. So they'd go and get a guard unit and put there. Well, the Jews themselves said he's already dead. We just want to make sure no one takes his body so there wouldn't be any deception. Now, men and women, the Jews have been, been accused of a lot of things, but very seldom have they ever been accused of stupidity. <laughs> they knew he was dead. The next fact I discovered was the burial procedure of the Jews. Some people say they were hurrying because of the Sabbath coming, therefore they had to bury him fast. Men and women, I checked this out in detail. And I documented in my Resurrection Factor book. The burial procedure was so important, they could even do it on the Sabbath. They didn't have to worry about the Sabbath coming up. They didn't want the body to hang on the cross once the Sabbath began. But they could take their time burying him. They would put around the body, in this case, a hundred pounds of aromatic spices along with a gummy or cement consistency. They would stretch the body out or straighten it out. They'd take a piece of linen cloth 30 centimeters wide. They would start to wrap the body from the feet. In between the folds, they put the cement consistency and the spices, wrap up to the armpits, put the arms down, start below the fingers, wrap to the neck, <coughs> and a separate piece around the head. In this situation, I would estimate an encasement of 117 to 120 pounds. The next fact that I discovered is that they took extreme security precautions at the tomb of Jesus Christ. One, it says they rolled a large stone against the tomb. Mark says the stone was extremely large. One historical reference going back to the first century has a, fra a reference put in there that 20 men could not move the stone. Now, I think he was being exaggerated a little bit there, but he was making a point about the size of the stone. Two engineering professors, after they heard me speak in the stone, went to Israel. As non-Christian engineering professors, they calculated the size needed to roll against a four and a half to five foot doorway of the Jewish tombs. They wrote me a letter document and said it would have to have a minimum weight of one and a half to two tons. Now, Mr. D. Dot in his books makes an issue that one man or two at the most rolled the stone against the entrance. Therefore, one or two men could roll it back. It says Joseph of Arimathea rolled the stone against the entrance. Now, men and women, don't force on the Bible or the Quran anything you would not force in conversation today. For example, when I came to the stadium the other day to look it over, one of the people that brought me here, I said, 
how did all these chairs get here? He said, Mr. D. Dot brought them. Mr. D. Dot, did you bring all 700 of these chairs personally yourself? No. It was brought, it was brought by many people. Many, I could go away from here and say, Mr. D. Dot put on this symposium. But I think there were some others that helped do all the arrangements. History says Hitler invaded France. Now, maybe he would have tried it. Maybe he would have tried it in France alone, but I don't think he would have tried on South Africa alone. There could have been a number of people that helped him. Plus, when you go back and research it out, the tombs had a trough going up to the side. They placed the stone there. They had a block. Then men and women. My seven-year-old daughter could roll it because you simply pull out the block. The stone rolls down the front, <coughs> excuse me, rolls down in the front and lodges itself against the entrance of the tomb. Then a security guard was put there. The Jews wanted one. They went to the Romans and said, give us a guard unit. Use the Greek word custodian that they were given. Men and women, a custodian was a 16-man security unit. Each man was trained to protect six square feet of ground, men and women. The 16 men, according to Roman history, were supposed to be able to protect 36 square yards against an entire battalion and hold it. Each guard had four weapons on his body. He was a fighting machine. And it's almost the same thing true of the temple police. Next, a Roman seal was placed on the tomb with a Roman insignia. That seal stood for the power and the authority of the Roman Empire. Men and women, the body of Christ was encased with a hundred and some pounds of cement and aromatic spices. Now something happened. It's a matter of historical record. After three days, the tomb was empty. Now I don't have to debate that. Mr. D. Dot agrees the tomb was empty. So I won't waste any time here. The sign of Jonah. I'm so glad you brought that up. The sign of Jonah. Uh, I'm not going to take too much time here because I don't think it's necessary in this sense. Whenever you study something, men and women, you study it in the language and the culture of that day. Now you go back to the Jewish language and the Jewish culture of that day, not today, not South Africa, not India, not America, the Jewish Israelite culture of that day. Let's see what three days and three nights. In Esther chapter 4, in the Old Testament of the Christian Jewish Bible, it says there was a fast for three days and three nights. But then, men and women, it says they completed the fast on the third day. You see, in Jewish language, reckoning, after three days and three nights meant to the third day or on the third day. Jesus said in Matthew 12:40. He would be buried for three days and three nights. In Matthew 20, Jesus said he would be raised up on the third day, not after the third day. The Jews came to Jesus. They said, Sir, in Matthew 27, verse 63, that deceiver said, After three days I am to rise again. So they asked for a Roman guard. Now, now watch the language here. Therefore, give orders for the grave to be made secure until the third day. Not after the third day. They knew when Jesus said three days and three nights meant until the third day. Lest his disciples come and steal him away. Men and women also... How much time do I have left? One minute? Did you hear the rain? Okay, thank you. Now,
three days and three nights until the third day. Friday before six o'clock, he had three hours to be buried. It took less than an hour. The Jewish reckoning of time in the Jewish Talmud and the Babylonian Jerusalem Talmud, the Talmud men and women are the commentaries of the Jews, said any part, or an onan, O-N-A-N, any part of a day is considered a full day. From Friday before six o'clock, from Jewish reckoning, any minute there was one day and one night. From Friday night at six o'clock to Saturday at six o'clock was another day and another night, men and women. From Jewish reckoning, not ours, from Jewish reckoning, any moment after six o'clock Saturday night was another day, another night. We do the same thing in my country. If my son, if my son was born one minute before midnight on December the 31st, on my income taxes to my government, I could treat my son with the same time principle as having been born one full year, 365 days, and 365 nights. Now, the Roman guard, when that Roman guard failed in duty, they were automatically executed. One way they were executed, they were stripped of their clothes and burned alive in a fire started with their own clothes. The seal was broken. Men and women, when that seal was broken, the security forces were thrown into finding that man or men. And when they were found, for anyone breaking that seal, it was crucifixion upside down. The stone was removed. Men and women, and I asked Mr. Didot to check it out carefully, the revealed Word of God in the Christian New Testament. If you study the original language of the Greek, like the Quran is in Arabic, the New Testament is in Greek. It points out that one and a half, two ton stone, men and women, was rolled up the slope away from not just the entrance, but away from the entire tomb, looking like it had been picked up and carried away. Now, men and women, if they wanted to tiptoe in, move the stone over, and help Jesus out, why all the effort to move a one and a half to two ton stone up away from the entire sepulcher? That guard unit would have had to have been sleeping with cotton in their ears with earmuffs on not to have heard that one. Then Mary went to the tomb. In John 20, Mr. Dedot says he went there to anoint the body and the word anoint means to massage. Well, let me tell you, if that's true, it's not, but if it was true, and that's the way Muslims do it, medical doctors, if I went through crucifixion, had my hands and feet pierced, my back laid open to the bowels, hundred and some pounds put around me, I wouldn't want anyone to massage me. The word anoint means consecrated, as Mr. D. Dot brought out in his book, the priests and kings were anointed when being concentrated, consecrated to their office. When they said, is my time up? When they said, touch me not, Mr. Didot says it means, I am hurting, don't touch me. Well, read on the next phrase, Mr. Didot. It says, do not touch me because I have not yet ascended to the Father. That's why not to touch him, because I've sent it to the Father. And then he says, now go tell my disciples I am ascending to the Father. A little bit later he said, you can touch me, grab my feet. Why'd they do that? Oh, men and women, this is one of the most beautiful things. In the Old Testament with the tabernacle, the Jewish high priest would take the sacrifice into the Holy of Holies. And the people would wait outside because they knew if God did not accept their sacrifice, the priest would be struck dead. They would wait for the high priest to come back. And when the high priest walked back out, everybody shouted with joy because they said, God has accepted our sacrifice. Jesus said, don't touch me. I have not ascended to the Father. Jesus, from that time until the others grabbed a hold and touched him, ascended to God the Father, presented himself as a sacrifice, and men and women, 
If Jesus had not come back, if he had not permitted the others to touch him, his sacrifice would never have been accepted. But I thank God he came back and said, touch me. It's been accepted. The spiritual, physical body of Jesus Christ. I think, Mr. D. Dot, you need to first study our scriptures. Amen. I think you need to read just as I need to study your scriptures. You need to read 1 Corinthians 15, 44 and see the explanation of the glorified, imperishable body. It was a spiritual body and yet it had substance. He could walk through a door. He could appear in their presence. He, yet he didn't need food, but he took food. Otherwise, they'd said you were merely spirit. No, he had what the Bible calls the resurrected, glorified, incorruptible body. And if I was in that room, and I knew I'd seen him crucified, buried, and everything else, and all of a sudden the doors are locked, he appears in my midst, I think I'd be a little frightened too. <laughs> Men and women, Jesus Christ is raised from the dead. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, and ladies and gentlemen of the jury, the crux of the problem, the clear-cut statement by Jesus Christ, that the mistake that the disciples were making in thinking that he had come back from the dead by assuring them that a spirit has no flesh and bones as you see me have. This is King's English, basic English. And one does not need a dictionary or a law to explain to you what it implies. Throughout the length and breadth of the 27 books of the New Testament, there is not a single statement made by Jesus Christ that I was dead and I have come back from the dead. We have been beating The Christian has been belaboring the word resurrection. Again and again by repetition, it is conveyed that it is proving a fact. You keep on seeing a man, the man is eating food, he says he was resurrected. He appears in the upper room, he was resurrected. Jesus Christ never uttered that word that I have come back from the dead in the 27 books of the New Testament, not once. He was there with them for 40 days, and he never uttered that statement. He is proving again and again that he is the same Jesus, the one who had escaped death, so to say, by the skin of his teeth, because he was ever in disguise. He never showed himself openly to the Jews. He had given them a sign. No sign shall be given unto it except the sign of Jonah, no sign, but this. And he never went back to them, to the temple of Jerusalem, to tell them, here I am, not once. He was ever in hiding. Now, we will not belabor the things that have passed. The points raised were that Jesus was not reluctant to die. He had actually come for this purpose. Now, my reading of the scriptures tells me that not only he was reluctant, but he was preparing for a showdown with the Jews. You see, at the Last Supper, he raises the pro problem of defense. He's telling his disciples, he says, you remember, when I sent you out on your mission of preaching and healing, and I told you that you were not to carry anything with you, no purse, no sticks, no staff. Did you lack anything? And they said, no, we lack nothing. But now I tell you, he tells them, that those of you who have no swords, swords, must sell their garments and buy them. You must sell your garments and buy swords. I'm asking you, what do you do with swords? Do you pair apples? 
or you cut people's throats. What do you do with swords? So one of them said, Master, we are two already. And he said, that is enough. And he takes his disciples, 11 of them, Judas had already gone to betray him, 11 disciples and himself, and they walked to Gethsemane. And at Gethsemane, read the book. Read your Gospels and it will tell you that Jesus puts eight men at the gate. I am asking you, why should he go to Gethsemane in the first place? And why put eight at the gate, telling them, stay here and watch with me. I mean, stop here and keep guard. Guarding what? What was there to guard in Gethsemane? A courtyard, olive press, empty place. What were they, the disciples, to guard five miles out of town at Gethsemane? I'll ask you. Then he takes with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee. At least two of them had swords. And he makes an inner line of defense and he tells them, Pray here, sit ye here and watch with me while I go and pray yonder. I alone go and pray beyond. I'm asking you, why did he go to Gethsemane? Why did he go there to pray? Couldn't he have prayed in that upper room where they had the Last Supper? Couldn't he have gone to the Temple of Jerusalem, a stone's throw from where they were? Why go five miles out of town? And why put eight at the gate? And why make an inner line of defense? And he goes a little further and falls on his face and he prays to God. He said, Oh my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass away from me, meaning remove the difficulty from me, but not as I will, but as thou wilt. In the end, I leave it to you, but I want you to save me. And he says, being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was as if it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Is this how one man, a person goes to commit suicide? Is this how a person who is ordained from the foundations of the earth for the sacrifice? Is this one how he behaves, I ask you? That he, f he is sweating, he says, being in an agony, he prays more earnestly, and his sweat was as if it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And the Lord of mercy, he sends his angel, says the Bible. An angel came to strengthen him. I say, in what? In the belief that God was going to save him. What does the angel come to strengthen him in? To save him. And everything that happened, from there onwards, you can see that God was planning his rescue. Look, the very fact that the prophecy he had made that he was to be like Jonah, and we are told that he was unlike Jonah, he didn't fulfill. He was, Jonah is alive, Jesus is dead. Then Pontius Pilate, he marveled when he was told that Jesus was dead because in his knowledge he knew no man can die within three hours on the cross because this crucifixion was to be a slow lingering death. This was the real purpose of crucifixion. It was not getting rid of an antisocial character like a firing squad or hanging or impaling a person. It was a slow lingering death and the bones were not broken, says the Bible. It was a fulfillment of prophecy. Now the bones of an individual of a dead person, whether you smash them, you break them or not, it's of the least consequence. What does it matter if a dead man, what you do to his bones? If the bones were not broken, the only time it can help anybody is if the person was alive. So you see now, this for 2,000 years now. You see, it's a programming, a continuous programming, and Paul has put the whole gamut of religion on one point, on this death and resurrection, because he tells us, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 14, he said, if Christ is not risen from the dead, your, our preaching is vain, our faith is vain, useless. You haven't got a thing. So now, like drowning men clutching at, clutching at straws, the Christian must hook up by proof, proof that somehow kill the man so we can earn salvation. Now, we would like you, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, to read this book once more again, and the testimony, word for word, you, if you examine the prophecies, what Jesus says, and the way he behaves, it is a conclusive proof that Christ had not been crucified.
I, I'm not sure that I heard myself. That you said nowhere in the 27 books of the New Testament did Jesus ever say he was dead, dead and alive. May I read to you from the book of Revelation, chapter 1, verse 18? He said, I am the living one. I was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. I also, Mr. Dedot, he appeared to the Jews. The whole New Testament was started with Jews. He appeared to the greatest Jewish antagonist, the Apostle Paul, when he was Saul of Tarsus, and brought him to himself. But men and women, the greatest thrill to me when it comes to the resurrection of my Lord and Savior is that God Yahweh has promised when a man enters into that relationship through asking Christ to forgive him, who died for our sins, was buried and raised again the third day, that God, the Holy Spirit, enters that person and changes them. And one of the greatest evidences is my own life. After I came to the point where I acknowledged Jesus Christ as my Savior and Lord, surrendered my will to Him and trusted Him, men and women, in about six months, a year, year and a half, the major areas of my life were changed. One, I developed a desire to live a holy and godly life. Second, I started to experience a peace and a genuine joy. Not, it wasn't because I don't have conflict, it's in spite of conflict, the peace that God gives through Jesus Christ. Third, I gained control over my temper. I almost killed a young man my first year in the varsity. I was constantly losing my temper. After I trusted Jesus as Savior and Lord, I would catch myself arriving to the crises and losing my temper, and it was gone. Not only did my friends notice it, but my enemies did a lot sooner. And only once now in 22 years that I have had a personal relationship with God Yahweh the Father through His eternal Word the Son, only once have I lost my temper. He has given me a supernatural strength over it. The greatest area, men and women, that I am thankful I can share here is the very love of God. In this sense, my father was the town alcoholic. I hardly ever knew my father when he was not drunk. My friends in school would make jokes about my father making a fool of himself. I, would, I lived on a farm. I'd go out in the barn, see my father lying in the gutter in the manure, the bathroom of the cows, beaten so bad by my father, my mother couldn't get up and walk. We would have friends over. Out of embarrassment as a son, I'd take my father, tie him up in the barn, and park the car up around the silo and tell the friends he had to go in important business so I wouldn't be embarrassed. I'd take him into the barn where the cows would have their little calves. I'd put his arms through the board and tie them. I'd put a rope around his neck and pull his head all the way over the back board and tie it around the feet so if he shuffled his feet, he would kill himself. My one sister committed suicide. Before I graduated from high school, I came home from a date two months before I graduated. I went into the house, heard my mother crying profusely, and I said, what's wrong? She said, your father has broken my heart. All I want to do is live until you graduate, then I just want to die. Do you know, men and women? Two months later, I graduated. And the next Friday, the 13th, my mother up and died. Don't tell me that you can't die of a broken heart. My mother did. My father broke it. There was no one I could have hated more. The men and women, when I came into this relationship with God, Yahweh, through His eternal Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, after a short period of time, the love of God took control of my life, and men and women, He took that hatred and turned it right upside down. 
So much so, I was able to look my father square in the eyes and say, Dad, I love you. And the neatest thing is, I really meant it. I transferred to another varsity or university. I was in a serious car accident with my legs, arm, and neck contraction. I was taken home. My father came into my room. He was very sober because he thought I was almost dead. He asked me this question, men and women. He said, how can you love a father such as I? I said, Dad, six months ago, I despised you. I hated you. Then I shared with him how I had come to the conclusion and seen so clearly that God, Yahweh, the Father, had manifested himself to us, humanity, through the eternal word, his Son. And that he had died for my sins. That's the anguish he went through, Mr. Dedad. If you can imagine all the sins of the world, your sins and my sins would be enough. But all the sins of the world upon his Son, the anguish that was. And I said, Dad, somehow I asked Christ to forgive me. I asked him to come into my life as Savior and Lord. I said, Dad, as the result of that, I have found the capacity to love and accept not only you, but other people just the way they are. I can look at you, Mr. D. and say, I honestly love you. God has given me that supreme. I, I love you so much, I'd love you to come to know Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. And my father... And my father finally just said, Son, if your God can do in my life what I have seen him do in your life, then I want to know him personally. Right there, my father just prayed something like this. God, if you're God, and Christ is the eternal word, your son, if you can forgive me and come into my life and change me, then I want to know you personally. Men and women, my life was basically changed in six months to a year to a year and a half. And there's still many areas for God to change. But let's say, my father, his life was changed right before my eyes. Mr. Dedado was like, somebody reached out and turned on a light bulb. Do you know, he only touched whiskey once after that. He got it to his lips, and that was it. He didn't need it anymore. Fourteen months later, he died because three-fourths of his stomach had to be removed as a result of 40-some years of drinking. But do you know, ladies and gentlemen, in that 14-month period, scores of businessmen in my hometown and surrounding area committed their lives to a living God through the eternal word, Jesus Christ. Because of the changed life of the town drunk. My wife, Dottie, puts it this way. She says, honey, because Christ was raised from the dead, he lives. And because he lives, he has an infinite capacity through the Holy Spirit to enter a man or woman's life and change them from the inside out. That is why the resurrected living Christ that said in one of the 27 books, I was dead, now I am alive. He can say, I stand in the door of your life and knock. If anyone hears my voice and open the door, I will come in. The final section consists of each speaker giving a three-minute conclusion. I now call upon Mr. Ahmed Zida. Mr. Chairman and ladies and gentlemen of the jury, man is covered by nature. From the beginning of Adam, remember passing the buck, it's not me, it's a woman, and the woman, it's not me, it's a serpent. Man is covered by nature, and we want somebody else to carry the burden for us. We want somebody else to take the medicine when we are sick. We want somebody else's appendix to be removed when ours is rotten. This is man in general. But Jesus Christ, 
This is not what he said. He wanted you to take up your own cross, get yourself crucified. Listen, he says, he is not of me who does not take his cross and follow me. Take up your cross and follow me. In other words, get yourself crucified. <laughs> no, 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 he didn't mean that. What he meant was that as I carry my responsibility, you carry yours. As I pray, you pray. As I fast, you fast. As I'm circumcised, you be circumcised. What I do, you do. You carry your own responsibility. This is what he meant. Now, th that is the Islamic system. This is what Islam teaches. You see, the system that saves you after years of alcoholism, after years of pinching 10 cents from the collection plate, you read it here, Josh's book. He said every Sunday the only thing he got out of church was he was putting in 25 cents and 30, taking out 35 for a milkshake. And then later on in life, if we study, we find the same thing is being done on a very high level of intellectualism. But we haven't got the time to go into that. Let me end with the message of Jesus. He says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except your righteousness exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, ye shall by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. There is no heaven for you. This is what he says. These are his words. And what is happening is, you are not contradicting his words. This is Islam. Unless you are better than the Jew, there is no heaven for you. He didn't say, it's a blood, but your righteousness. You must be better than the Jew. You must fast, as the Jews fasted, but on a higher level. You must pray, as the Jews prayed, but on a higher level. You must give charity, as the Jews gave charity, but on a higher level. And that is Islam. So, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I say that this resurrection, as has been addressed by Josh in America, under the heading, hopes of history, I would conclude that here are 1,000 million people are being taken for a ride on a cross. They are being taken for a ride on a cross. In Durban, every week we have our horses taking thousands of people for a ride, every horse. But here, eh, you are being taken for a ride on a cross. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Mr. D. Dot, nowhere in the Christian Bible is revealed by God is a Christian ever commanded to be crucified. We are told to be acknowledged that we are already crucified in Jesus Christ. In Romans 8.32, God speaking from eternity into time says, he who did not spare his own son, but delivered him us up for us all. In my country, a young lady was picked up for speeding, brought before the judge. The judge said, guilty or not guilty? She said, guilty. He brought down the gavel, and the judge fined her $100 for 10 days. Then amazing thing took place. The judge stood up, took off his robe, placed it over the back of the chair, went down in front, and paid the fine. What's the explanation of that? The judge was her father. He was a just judge. His daughter had broken the law. No matter how much he loved his daughter, he had to say a hundred dollars for ten days. But he loved her enough, he was willing to go down and take the penalty upon himself and pay it. This is a clear illustration of what God Yahweh has revealed through his holy word. God loves us. Christ died for us. The Bible very clearly points out the wages of sin is death. So God had to bring down the gavel. But men and women, he loved us so much he was able to set aside his judicial robes in the man Jesus and come down in the form of the man Jesus Christ and go to the cross and pay the price for us.
Now he can say, I stand the door of your life and knock. And if anyone hear my voice and open the door, I will come in. Yes, Mr. D. Dot, one billion Christians are riding on the cross. We are being taken. I believe God has provided the cross as the chariot to heaven through the shed blood of his divine son. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for giving me a privilege of person from another country to come here. And Mr. DeCott, I'm really committed to you for this opportunity. And uh, when you come to my country, we'll have dinner together. You pay and I'll pray. Okay, thank you.